McNeil. I'm, I'm the Director of External Relations and Development for the Fraser River Discovery Center. Uh, I wanna welcome you here. Uh, before we get started though, I do wanna acknowledge the news, uh, the, the, the tragic news that came out of Williams Lake today with the Williams Lake First Nation and the former residential school there. And uh, just uh, say that our, our, uh, our thoughts are with uh, all, the, all the First Nations people up there and all the people who are impacted. Um, next, uh, before we get formally started, I very graciously, um, Elder Larry Grant from the Musqueam Indian Band has uh, offered to do a welcome for us. So Larry, I'll turn that over to you. Thank you, Stephen. Good evening, everyone. Uh, uh, good to be here. See you to see yet. See you all attend to swell up the hui namat hui to e at shwayamat the skakatal with see it namat e nanamat to mug them on. The egg when it's your winner. That is something neat to swell up a hilox dollar, a theatala to mug all up with hui namat to now whale. I want to say thank you. Thank you to everyone that logged on and uh, I'd like to welcome you here this evening. As our ancestor had done in the past, I do the same and raise my hand and welcome to all of you logged on here in Westminster at Schwiemann. Uh, and that's um, uh, the way we call this area from the Musqueam people, Shwayamas. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Larry. And uh, I just saw a note in the chat, we are recording this, um, this dialogue and uh, hopefully that's uh, okay with everyone. If not, you are of course free just to listen and not ask questions. And we'll, we'll, we'll be uh, doing some initial editing and then we'll post that on our site. Um, so tonight we're doing this dialogue in partnership with the city of New Westminster, the Fraser River Discovery Center in the city of New Westminster. And I have uh, three colleagues who will be uh, doing it tonight with me, one from the Discovery Center, uh, Karen Lee, our Director of Operations, and two from the city of New Westminster uh, Museum and Archives, uh, Rob McCullough, and also Rebecca Salas. And I'm gonna turn it over to Rebecca to, uh, to help introduce our panelists, Rebecca. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, yeah, I would just like to give every uh, panelist here with us an opportunity to introduce themselves. And so, Larry, um, I think we'll start with you if you'd like to uh, provide an introduction. Mm -hmm. I'm, uh, I'm Larry Grant from the uh, Musqueam First Nation. Ayatluk is my Musqueam name, and uh, our I'm uh, one of the elders from Musqueam. And I'm also with the First Nations House of Learning at the University of British Columbia as resident elder and adjunct professor in the First Nations and endangered language, instructing the Hunt Kaminam language program that we have with UBC. And also I am a one of the resident elders at the Justice Institute of British Columbia, the Westminster campus. And uh, yeah, that's who I am. Thank you, <laughs> honored to have you. Um, next up, Kamala. Uh, thanks, Tonse everyone. Um, speaking to you from uh, what's colonially known as Gibsons over here in the uh, Squamish territories. Um, but I was born and raised all over uh, the lands of the Hunkaminam and Squamish speaking people, um, now known as Metro Vancouver. Um, my own ancestors are Métis and Cree on my mom's side and Eastern European on my dad's side. And I've been working for many years as a community planner and filmmaker to really look at, um, carry the teachings that people like Larry have given to me about these lands and. Um, how much the rights and title holders have been erased from their lands and doing my part through film and community planning to really address that and um, honor to be here. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Kamala. Uh, perhaps we'll move to Kirsten now. Hey, um, my name is Kirsten Amiko McAllister. I was 
born and raised on the uh, the territories of the Nanook people on um, in what is now known as the colonial city of Nanaimo. And I work and live on the territories of the Squamish, the Musqueam, and the Sable Tooth. I'm uh, I, I teach and research at Simon Fraser University. And in terms of my who I am, um, my mother was uh, one of the Japanese Canadians who was interned by the Canadian government. So one of the 21,000 who, who were rounded up in 1942, incarcerated and then forced to leave the province in 1945, either shipped to Japan or scattered across the west, rest of Canada. And that's why for me, um, monuments are, and are very, very political. Um, and the, um, the authority they assert over space um, is very political. Thank you. And Maddie. Thanks, Rebecca. I'm Maddie, a white settler of Scot Scottish, Irish, and French descent, uh, currently residing on Coast Salish territories here in Burnaby. I'm a uh, doctoral candidate at Simon Fraser University, where my research concerns placemaking and also intersects with settler colonial studies. A key question for me is how settler Canadians navigate the relationships to place in the context of increasing recognition of unceded land and efforts at decolonization. I've also spent time researching museums, memory, and commemoration. I'm also a research assistant. Uh, for a project with the New West Museum and Archives and Simon Fraser University that involves looking at and understanding the city's commemorative practices with the aim of informing a city policy on commemoration. Through this project, I was responsible for cataloging and researching city monuments so that we could have information on what's already being commemorated uh, and then start to interrogate what's missing. Um, and I'm really honored to be part of this conversation. Great, thank you very much. Thank you to all of our panelists and thank you, Rebecca, for, uh, for leading that. Uh, I'm just gonna spend a couple of minutes talking a little bit more about the dialogue in terms of the topic and the approach we're gonna take um, and how you can participate, uh, you the audience. Um, as, as we've mentioned in the introduction, we're gonna talk about monuments of the Fraser and, and those can be plaques, they can be objects, they can be statues or physical features or places. And anybody, for example, who's walked along the boardwalk down at the Quay uh, can see a number of those monuments there. And we, our panelists may well talk about those. Um, as in our discussion, and we've talked to the panelists about this, we're reflecting about the original intent of those monuments. So, you know, why were they put there in the first place? What were the reasons for that? And what they communicate to residents and visitors today? Because obviously, uh, a lot has changed and time has gone by. And so we're looking forward to having a discussion uh, with our panelists about that and then taking questions from the audience uh, after that. Um, the other thing I'll just point out, uh, for those of you who don't know, at uh, the Discovery Center, is we are working with the Musqueam, uh, with, with uh, Larry's council and his staff um, on a number of Indigenous initiatives. And the key one is something called the Watatalam in the Hunkamanam language, which is to help develop the Fraser River Discovery Center, uh, part of it anyway, into a place of learning about the Indigenous heritage um, and, uh, and teachings of the Fraser River. And uh, we have a memorandum of understanding with the, uh, with the Musqueam Indian Band to do that. It's gonna be a long process, but these kind of programs are, are, are key to us uh, developing Watatalam together with the Musqueam. So um, I just wanted to make sure people knew that if they, if they weren't aware. Um, the format for tonight was we've developed a, a number of questions uh, and we've shared them with the panel um, so that they're not surprised by them and they could give them some thought um, in terms of answering them. And uh, after I finish my opening comments, we're going to alternate uh, Rob, Rebecca, Karen and I and, uh, and, and ask those questions and give all the panelists an opportunity to respond. Um, and we're going we're gonna to ask them to, to try to keep it as short as possible, one to two minutes per person, because that will leave time for questions from the audience. Um, given the number of people that we have, and we have over 50 people uh, on this call, so thank you very much for joining today. Um, obviously, we have a topic that's of interest, um, which is great. Um, to manage that number of people, and I do a lot of this in my business, uh, both in person and virtual facilitation, um, we're going to use 
the chat room for the questions. Um, with that many people, it would become very difficult to try to manage hands up and who's asking and when and things like that. So if at any time you have a question starting now, because the chat room is open, um, you can put a, put a question in the chat. Myself and, and Karen, uh, my colleague, we're gonna be monitoring that um, and, uh, and we'll be asking the questions from there. To ensure that everybody gets a chance um, to ask a question if they want. Uh, the approach that I've used in the past that we're gonna use tonight is uh, I'll, we'll, we'll identify someone's question, we'll ask it. And then after the panel has answered it, we'll go on to a question from someone else. And we won't come back to the same person until we've canvassed the list and to make sure that everybody's comment or question gets to be addressed. And uh, again, in my experience, that's the fairest way to try and ensure that there's uh, participation from everybody who wants to participate. Doesn't mean that you won't get a chance to ask a second question. It just means we want to make sure that um, everybody can have a chance if they want to participate. Uh, the last thing I'll say before we get to the questions is uh, kind of a little history of the dialogue series, which we've been doing for five or six years now, starting in person and virtual the last couple of years with the pandemic. And the goal is to have an open and constructive conversation um, about the topic tonight, as it always is. And we value all comments and opinions from everybody, from our panelists, from the audience, from us as co-hosts and facilitators. But the absolutely critical thing is that we be, be respectful uh, in our questions questions in our responses um, in the comments in the chat. Um, that's the only way to, uh, to have, in our view and in our experience, to have really successful conversations. And we've dealt with a number of significant topics and issues related to the Fraser River in the past. And by taking this approach, we've been able to do that. This is not a political debate. Uh, we, we haven't asked people to bring their ideologies with them, but we do want to, uh, we encourage open discussion, we encourage opinions, but we just need to be respectful in, the, in how we uh, provide those opinions and how we respond to them. So I just wanted to let people know about that. We haven't had any problems in the past, but I just wanted to, I always say that one when, when we start. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleagues to start asking the questions. And Karen, I think you are the one who gets to ask the first question. Yeah, um, sorry, I'm just minding the chat as well. Um, so we're gathered here today to talk about monumentalism. And so um, we're going to pose the question and um, ask, each of the panelists to speak to it, but I, I might pose this um, and start with um, Elder Larry Grant first. Um, so the question is, what are monuments to you? Um, why do we have monuments? And from your spec perspective, um, how, what do you define a monument to be? Uh. A monument to me is uh, something that uh, a uh, contemporary thing introduced by the immigrant settlers that uh, want to keep part of their their history in view of the public so that they're not forgotten. And many of these are, uh, uh, for me, I, I have, uh, I don't know, the, a, lot of the, a lot of the monuments are not uh, uh, proper monuments in the sense that uh, they have not researched fully in the history of those people that they uh, uh, glorify in those monuments. And, uh, and in Coast Salish culture, there are no monuments that we're aware of. There are transformation sites. Uh, many times there are different, uh, 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 different rocks that are, are, are uh, uh, recognized as certain specific things, but there are no monuments in Coast Salish culture. We'd, we do have outposts that are raised and used inside houses. They're not on the outside of the houses. We don't have totem poles. Uh, that's a Northern concept. And when I say Northern, it's, it's from the, the uh, Camel River area North. 
up into Alaska that have totem poles, or they might be on the west coast of Vancouver Island, but in traditionally there were no totem poles in this area, but they have been gradually being introduced because people want art pieces that symbolize things and they have no historical content to the area that they're raised in. Very much like I understand there's a new installation in Westminster by an artist that doesn't come from here. So that's a brand new installation, I think. So it's for me, that's uh, infringing uh, and, and incorporating and melding cultures together to make uh, a pan-Indigenous concept of monumentalism. Um, that's a little bit of my understanding and how I, uh, how I think about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Do we want to go to uh, Kamala? Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Um, definitely much of my understanding has come from you um, in terms of, you know, the places that you've pointed out and, and what's obscured by some of those places. Um, I grew up in South, in Marple, so South Vancouver along the river for a lot of my youth. And then uh, for seven years, my family, me and my husband and my two sons lived in New West. So a lot of time on, on the river. And definitely for me, I mean, my whole focus is about story and the story of the city and, you know, the built environment itself, it definitely normalizes and, and fixes colonial uh, perspectives and, and value systems and, and ways of living um, to the point where a lot of people don't even recognize it and don't know that it represents an, an erasure of, you know, the original uh, ways of living here and languages and rights and title and legal systems and so on. Um, and so for a lot of us, it's the literal stories and texts and monuments that we encounter in the urban environment that help us to understand what is this place? So they are meant to be um, representations of who we are as a society. You know, who are our heroes? Who who help make this place? Who you know? Who do we look up to? Who do we want to recognize? Um, and they tell a very specific story. And so, of course, you know, um, growing up in Vancouver, it took me a while to start to really understand the deeper history of whose lands I was on. I mean, I knew it was all Indigenous land, but you know, what the villages and the languages and so on. So when I would take my sons down to the river, you know, the endless frustration at seeing the colonial great white fathers continuously um, commemorated and written into the land itself is some kind of reflection of the story of this place and what's erased by that and how your everyday resident who doesn't have that knowledge or visitor who doesn't have that knowledge is never going to learn the truths of the land. They're always going to think it's the Fraser River. They're always going to think it's New Westminster and, you know, made, and you look at the tourism website for New West and they start the history at 18, 1859. So that narrative of, you know, that the, the white settlers built this place and, and are the storytellers of this place is completely reinforced by pretty much all of what you see um, on the land in terms of plaques or texts or statues and even the public art. Um, which you know, I'm sure is becoming a little more reflective, but as Larry said, um, it might be indigenous, but not from these lands. But who got to decide, you know, who got to design and, and decorate the city and, you know, make the parameters for, for how um, that is selected. So there's much shifts that are needed. All I can say is for me, it's triggering, and these aren't even my lands, but to walk and just continuously see, um, you know, the stories of the the, the white pioneers um, being told and retold and, and marking the land and telling a very um, you know inaccurate story and history of the place. And on that same um, token or same you know stream, by remaking and retelling and, and reinscribing um, you know the thousands of years of continuity of the people on back onto the land, 
has incredible um, power and possibility for transforming people's understanding of place, which is why I've always been so focused on public art and you know naming and those kinds of things and and also storytelling. So um, you know, there's that incredible duality of you know the harm that those monuments can ca can cause in reinforcing some of those you know genocidal stories and um, celebrating genocide, in fact. And then also the incredible possibility that can happen when you know, things are opened up and where the first people can actually have a say in, in how their land is marked. So that's how I wanna start, thank you. Thanks, Kamala. That duality between erasure and uh, reconnection is really meaningful. Um, and it really applies to the work of both um, Kirsten and Maddie as well. Kirsten, would you like to speak to the question, what are monuments to you? Um, thank you. Um, just referring back to what Elder Larry Grant said and Camilla Todd said, um, I think our understanding of monuments in, the, in this region, the dominant understanding is very Western and very imperial. So just thinking about what I've learned from my elders in the Japanese Canadian community when I work with them on building a memorial, on one of the internment centers where they were interned and they continued to live <clears throat> for years after, um, which is the Nikkei Internment Memorial Center in New Denver in British Columbia. I'm trying to think of what they taught me. So I want to step back and think about the monument. And one way to think about the monument is um, what living communities construct and maintain in the places they live um, that are symbolically important to their identity and their world order. So here um, I'm thinking of their identity and world order um, in terms of how both are based on relations to other people. So thus monuments can um, commemorate events, facts, uh, sorry, acts, um, places and people that define this living community. In addition, um, Monuments can also be built and maintained in order to um, to to uh, to value symbolically important places um, that encapsulate the identities and world orders of that community that are based on that community's relation to the land, to the waters, to the animals and life forms, to the spirits and the sacred worlds that sustain those people. So that's a very broad uh, definition. And I think we really need to rethink our definition and our approach to monumentalizing because the conventional definition of monuments has been very much um, a settler imperial definition as um, Camila has uh, so eloquently just defined. And those monuments are a way of asserting a particular identity and world order over places. So in naming streets that immortalize patriarchal colonial figures, in erecting plazas, monuments, and buildings that glorify military figures, uh, colonial legal systems, um, we're not just narrating um, one particular story and uh, of um, the uh, and world order, but we're also, as Camilla um, pointed out, erasing people. And I really want us to think about, and I'm trying to get my head around this, what would a monument look like that entails um, an assertion of what is our responsibility to each other? What would a monument look like that um, speaks of our responsibility to the waters and the land in a larger time frame, not just the 100 year uh, time frame of colonialism or 200 time, uh, time frame of colonialism or the 500 year time frame, but in terms of the time scale of the nations here, who, um, as Camila and uh, Elder Larry Grant have said, um, think and act in time scales of thousands of years. So that's what I have to say about monuments. Great, thank you, Kirsten. Um, Madeline, you've been doing a lot of work around monuments in New Westminster. Um, what do monuments mean to you? Before starting 
think I would have said, I think I would have had a very limited definition of monuments, uh, one that refers to memorials, to people or events, and really refers to the form of that monument. Uh, usually we think of statues or busts, but the more research I did and the more conversations we had surrounding monuments, uh, I think we really came to question this definition. And I, I agree with Kirsten that I think we need a much broader definition. Um, and I find it more useful to think about a definition of monument that refers more <clears throat> to the intent behind the creation or placement of something rather than its physical form, that intent being the desire to commemorate or mark something or someone. Um, in this way, street names that reflect particular people are monumental. Um, the name of the river that we're talking about is monumental. Um, when the city accepts a gift and places it somewhere, they're making a decision to treat that thing as a monument. Um, in terms of why we have monuments, um, some research suggests that monuments serve to anchor collective remembering. Uh, remembering and memory is a dis uh, dispersed and changing and intangible process. So monuments are sometimes seen as a way to place them in tangible sites. Um, and I think this is something that we need to question throughout this night. Um, <clears throat> but obviously we also need to think about the power involved in this anchoring and who is deeming what's important. Um, although monuments might be thought to represent a collective memory or place a collective memory, they don't really emerge out of the collective. They come from specific individuals. They're built by people with sufficient power to marshal or impose public consent for their erection. Um, if we look at a few examples from New West, uh, why we have monuments is very specific to different monuments, uh, but ultimately it does come down to individual people, uh, people from the community, people from uh, development company boardrooms, people on the council and advisory boards. Um, we have some monuments because people from the community come forward with ideas about something or someone they wanna see commemorated, uh, such as Megan's Place or the Herb House Rose Garden. We have other monuments because they were donated to the city and the city lacked a policy for deciding whether to accept or reject those don donations, uh, like the Orca Whale or the Cosmic Maypole. And we have other monuments because condo developers wanted to bring a measure of distinction and historical specificity to their buildings like we see throughout Sacreton. Um, so monuments are <laughs> very complicated. Uh, for me, I think they can be very powerful placemakers. Um, and I think they can be more personal than we might expect. Thank you, Maddie. Thank you to all the panelists for, for uh for setting the context for, for this uh, discussion from their perspectives. And now, Rebecca, you get to ask the next question of the, of the panel. Thank you. So again, we'll, um, we'll start with Larry. The question is, can you identify one or two monuments along the Fraser that speak to you or jump out at you and what your thoughts are uh, on those monuments or that monument? I think you're muted, Larry. And I think for me, along the Fraser, there's uh, not much that I'm aware of as monumental. There's Simon Fraser's bust there, where he supposedly discovered all the Indians on the river uh, who existed there for thousands of years. and. Uh, they uh, don't go into his, uh, his real history uh, in the time that he spent on the river and who was there helping him to live, to survive, to exist in the, in the uh, time that he was coming down the river. Uh, that river wasn't floating around in the universe, it was right there. And uh, he, uh, I, I like the word discovery. And uh, these things are here. It's like the new discovery of a new world in the universe that's been there for millions of years, but it's a discovery. 
you know. And then we go down the river and at Gary Point, there's a, a, a mending needle in there. There's a fisher, they call it a fisherman's needle. And that's a, something that existed as a shuttle for mending nets or, or building nets. And uh, our people had nets for thousands of years, but there's no reference to them. Uh, and and just, just right here, uh, right at Westminster, we have McBride Boulevard. Uh, and McBride was a member of the McKenna McBride reserve system that actually denied the first people's access to land. So, uh, so that monument is there. And uh, further down towards uh, like in uh, Metro, Metro Vancouver, we have Trutch Street and that down river in the Vancouver area. And Trutch was the first one to deny any, any indigenous rights and title in, in Canada. So these are those horizontal monuments that were mentioned earlier. And that's uh, something that after a lot of discussion and understanding exactly the role that Trutch or McBride have played, uh, they, uh, they don't like what they've uh, discovered in their history. And that, uh, for me, that's uh, something that I, I, uh, I don't know. And, and I know the Samson, I know the Samson as a boy. It's one of those uh, uh, stern wheelers that was a, picked up all the dead heads and snags out of the river. And they would come down river and dump it on the foreshore of Musqueam. So it's, uh, it's another symbol uh, uh, of how they didn't care where they put it as long as it wasn't in front of the city of New Westminster and along that foreshore. So that's uh, really, uh, uh, for me, it's, uh, it uh, doesn't make sense that, that you have a, a Samson that goes up and down the river picking up snags and they drop the snags off in front of the, the indigenous communities. So it, uh, that's what it symbolizes for me. It also, but it also, it does have, uh, in my mind as a child, that was, a, that was a, an amazing boat that came down and you got to uh, see different forms of mechanism that were being used, but uh, all of the things that are there it just doesn't make uh, much sense to me in that sense. Uh, we have bridges that cross with, with uh, <clears throat> like Alec Fraser Bridge, uh, Port Man Bridge, and uh, uh, the Oak Street Bridge, you know, and uh, uh, Knight Street Bridge. And who are these people? The bridges are there that uh, that they are huge monuments, and we drive over them. And don't consider them monuments. Uh, and those and those those communities existed there prior to uh, uh, colonialism beginning. So that uh, uh, what I think is uh, there is no indication of who was here prior to colonial people arriving and who helped the colonial people to survive while they're beginning to understand how to live in this world that existed for thousands of years and the white man couldn't live in it without the assistance of the indigenous people. There's nothing there to exemplify that. 
very much like who was there to help build the railroad? Indigenous people, Chinese people. And there is no monument for that. The only monument for that is in Chinatown, where it shows a Chinese person being assisted that is hurt and is being assisted by an indigenous person and the white guys are in the back. Now that, that's the only monument that I'm aware of that Westminster is the royal city. It's uh, the big monument is, uh, it's the royal city. Uh, uh, I can't remember what queen is, was uh, ex immortalized from that, from this uh, uh, queen from a country that is part of the, the main stem of freedom and democracy and is able to be immortalized in how it subjugates and assimilates people around the world. You know, that's not just here, it's in, in the other beginnings of colonialism here in, in uh, the West Coast. So that uh, we have the city of Victoria that immortalizes the queens of a far off country that has no, uh, no problem uh, saying that they rule the world, that Britain rules the whole world and that the sun never sets on the British Empire. And, and this royal city is the monument to that. And that's a, a really a, a you know, hard thing to swallow that with being indigenous and, and seeing the different uh, people on the 24th of May uh, parades back in the day uh, the early days of the city of New Westminster, you know, and it's and New Westminster is it, it's it's named after a town in England, Westminster, and uh, this is New Westminster. So it's uh, it's another the name itself is a huge money. So that. Uh, a little bit of that, uh, how, I, uh, how I see the monuments along the river. And, uh, I don't see anything. I, uh, there, I know Musqueam <clears throat> worked in the area of uh, Annieville Slough and that self-support uh, self of the Alec Fraser Bridge. And Musqueam has put up uh, uh, some timelines in there. And lo and behold, almost immediately or completely defaced. And uh, our monuments are defaced. And there's no recognition other than uh, in the corner of a history book. Oh, that's nice, but thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Larry. Thank you for sharing personal knowledge, community knowledge, and also, I think, bringing the conversation to a, a much <laughs> higher yeah. perspective. I'm going to be chewing on a lot of that, I think, for tonight. Um, Kamala, I know you'll have much to add here. Sure, I guess what I think about... Um, when you go down there, uh, definitely there's this sense of this kind of industrial narrative, this commercial narrative um, that's both historical and contemporary and celebrated and kind of like um, marketed and as part of the branding of, of the river and New West. Um, and so to me, um, that, that narrative that has erased 
um, and has fixed Fraser as the identity and the colonial history and has erased you know, everything that Larry's talking about people and his people and ancestors for thousands of years and that relationship. Um, and so the, the fixing of that narrative means that people think of it as, you know, it's first of all, you can't swim in it. Um, it's known to be quite <clears throat> polluted, at least down here in the more urbanized area. And so it's just kind of become this understanding of this kind of like commercialized, industrialized body of water, which then uh, reinforces the mistreatment that's happened over the generations of all the industrial pollution that's been, you know, permitted to happen there is just part of, oh yeah, this is where we're gonna put it and we're gonna dump everything into here, um, you know, without any consideration to, you know, Musk Williams' relationship with the water and other nations up along the river and, and their use of that water and the ecosystems that it's always supported to the point where, you know, it's so um, accepted that that's just how it is. And, and now with the TMX drilling going under there, it's just, the, the value and the importance and the sacredness and you know its role as a provider um, for the people and, and transportation, all of the things that it means, which I'm not gonna try to define, but um, none of that is considered because that is being erased and ignored and written out of the story. And so people feel entitled to come in and dig and destroy that body of water um, for a pipeline. Um, for other projects that continue to harm. And so the story matters, right? So as, as Larry expresses the anguish of that, of you know, seeing a place named for a queen or you know, named for an explorer who was not a good guy. Um, and so for me, actually, Ronnie Dean Harris's Sturgeon mural is sort of like this one bit of beauty and light in, that's visible on the land. Um, because it is a reminder. It's a reminder of the beings who, who belong to that water, you know, the, the, the many different um, animal relatives that, that the people here have and who are important to them and um, that, you know, the, so many of us don't think about um, and who in fact were almost fished to extinction. Um, and so it's sort of like that little reminder, you know, and then when Larry shared with me the story of how salmon came to the river, which we did for the video at the FRDC, you know, this, this revelation of like, the people have a story that goes back as far as knowing when the salmon first came to this place. Like that's how far back the knowledge goes. And that's how far back the relationship goes to be able to explain that first time when, when that incredible being, you know, the salmon came to this place. Um, where is that reflected on the land itself? Sure, the videos in the in the Fraser River Center, which is great, but you know, where is that reflected and how can people understand that? Because they need to understand that in order to treat that water in a better way, in order to um, be more humble and respectful as they move through this place and to actually question and challenge the Royal City and all of those things that, that Larry has shared as, as really perpetuating and celebrating, you know, this genocidal past and, and then using that, using that as a marketing, you know, like I was living in the US when the new branding of the crown logo, you know, and it was just like, that's what you want to celebrate. And that's what you're proud of. But what, what is contained within that narrative? Like what happened within that royal history? You know, let's talk about that. Let's talk about what all of these stories and plaques and monuments and figures represent and what was happening to the people. And you have to care about what happened to the water and what happened to the people. Um, you can't just keep saying, oh, well, that was then, this is now. And, you know, but at least we did this and look at this great place that we made and let's all move forward together. No, you need to, um, you need to ask harder questions. And like Larry said, there's nothing to reflect it. Nowhere, as far as I can tell, you know, Ronnie's piece is beautiful. Um, he's, you know, further up the river, um, but even with, the name, like, why is there nothing to reflect the truth of that place? And I'm hoping that this can inspire and that the work that you're all doing will inspire um, some change in that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kirsten, over to you. Uh, does anyone need me to repeat the question? I'm sure you're prepared. Um, I, I'm okay, but feel free to intervene if I'm not 
being direct enough. Um, I want to start just with um, the very generous invitation um, by Rebecca Salas to for me to be part of this panel. Um, I, and I want to say that in being asked to speak about the monuments, the monumentalization of settler um, legacy, the living legacy, the continuing legacy in New West, um, also was a point, and I'm going to use this very problematic word that Elder Larry Trent underlined as very problematic. I'm going to say it allowed me a way to discover. So this is discovery that I went through by being in through this invitation, this gracious invitation. Um, because on my, as I said, on my mother's side, um, she's from the Japanese Canadian community. I'm Japanese Canadian. And the ways in which Japanese Canadians have been removed from and erased from um, settlements as racialized settlers, but they were removed as a race. Um, the Canadian government identified us as of Japanese racial origin, a race that was undesirable. So it had to be removed. So in this project of looking at monuments in New West, it's also been a process of discovering Japanese Canadians before they were moved in the city. And I have to say on my great grandmother's side, um, on my father's side, the Macquarie McAllister side, my great grandmother actually lived in New West um, just after World War II. They lived in Nelson, BC, and the great flu influenza swept through um, and killed my great grandfather. So my great grandmother and my grandmother moved to New West. So I have settler roots, white settler roots in this city as well. Um, they didn't stay in the city long. I also worked in New West for a colonial organization, the Pacific Salmon Commission, that divides up the pink salmon runs and the sockeye salmon runs that go up the Fraser River. And that organization was um, housed in the old post office building. And so it's very complicated for me in this process of discovery, but I, I in looking through the uh, museum's records in reading through the archival uh, documents that I have on hand, I learned about Japanese Canadians in the Queensboro um, neighborhood. My own family, as I'll discuss with regard to the next question, is a fishing family on my mother's side. And so that relationship to uh, the, the river is, is very important. So when I was walking through New West, and as Rebecca, Stephen, Pam, Karen, and Maddie were introducing me to the, the walkway, all of this all of these um, legacies and histories were, were, were sort of crowding through my mind and through my body. And one of the monuments that um, I guess confronted me and made me upset was the Hayek Anvil battery story. Yeah. I'll just read some of the quote. It says, um, loyalty to the crown has been strong since the royal city's inception over the years. The Royal Salute was fired by various military groups. In the time, in time, the military aspect diminished and in order to continue the salute, some loyal citizens took upon, up the challenge and fired in their own unusual way. And then the plaque explains the story of the Hayek Anvil battery story. And what strikes me is that this plaque was presented in 1992. So that was after I had worked as a student in New West for the Pacific Salmon Commission. So I was alarmed <laughs> to see that this was the ethos, this was um, kind of, um, uh, I guess the spirit of the citizens at that time. And I, I didn't realize it um, when I was working there. At the same time, I recognize that New Westminster as a city council has actually confronted um, the colonial legacy and monuments. For example, um, there's the, I think the statue of Begbie that the city hall removed, and I think is in a, a, a project in the museum now. Oh, is that the one that's lying down? And so 
there's this tussling or struggle within the city with different voices um, and efforts and this very panel to confront that legacy. I also want to say that walking through the um, along the waterfront, what what moved me also was the narratives and the stories that Rebecca and Stephen and Pam and Karen and Maddie told me that weren't inscribed in the plaques and this sort of vision of what another way to think of this place could be. And um, both Rebecca and Stephen talked about Poplar Island, which was uh, which is a very important um, island for the, the nations um, along the river. And I remember after the um, after they showed me the um, they walked us along the riverfront and they they introduced reintroduced me to to the city uh, waterfront area as it's been narrated in this problematic industrial way. Um, I went back and I walked I walked again and I walked along the river and. I remember going down the hill and seeing Poplar Island, and I don't know what its proper name is, so my apologies. And just feeling moved by um, the trees and the life on that island that were um, tall, um, powerful trees. And um, some of them were entombed, I think, in ivy. But I was trying to think about what sort of um, what that island was trying to tell us. Um, and what, what it meant and what it would mean if um, a new relationship to this island was created in dialogue, um, if, if, if this would be the appropriate thing to do. But that, that to me, that island was um, an act in and of itself of the river, of those trees um, in, in, in informing me and telling me about a legacy that wasn't necessarily narrated into the, the walkway. So I'll, I'll end with that. Thank you so much. Um, I'll turn it over to, to Maddie. I'm sure she has lots to add here as she's been doing um, audit of these, these pieces along the river. Thanks, Rebecca. I don't wanna take up too much time here because I, I don't have the long history of being in New Westminster that the other panelists do, and I'm conscious of the time. Um, but monuments along the river that speak to me, uh, and monuments in general that speak to me, are ones that speak more to the specific history and stories of a place. Um, a lot of public art in the city, as, as well as other cities, tends to draw on really non-specific ideas about nature. Um, some examples in New West include like Birds on a Branch or Ab Ovo, some of the mosaics, um, the Orca Whale, the Cosmic Maypole, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we can look at the city street names and see how many are based on trees. Uh, and while we can certainly talk about the way these claims to nature serve to attempt to indigenize settlers and obscure the social relations surrounding a place, um, Nature as a commemorative theme is fairly safe, um, or it's at least seen as safe. Uh, so I much prefer um, monuments and public art pieces that, that really speak to a specific place. Um, the one that came up for me was uh, Wow Westminster. Maybe this is a bit of nostalgia since it's gone, um, but I can remember moving here from Ontario and uh, using my scant Ge geographic knowledge of Metro Vancouver to realize that we were going over a bridge and there is the big W and that must be New Westminster in front of me and Sur Surrey behind me. Um, so it was a really powerful place marker for me. Thanks. Thanks, Maddie. Uh, Rob McCullough, the next question for the panelists is, is yours, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you all for the perspectives you've been adding to this. Um, I'm going to ask you to contemplate and think a little bit more about some of the things that we've been discussing here, but specifically to the river. Um, Elder Grant, um, in contemplating what the river is, what the river was, and what the river should be, can you tell us from your perspective what monuments could speak to the river's significance? or how monuments can speak to the river's significance. 
Oh, my name is Ken. Uh, I couldn't quite hear the last part. Of what Sir, you can you tell us what your perspective is on how monuments could speak to the river's significance? Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, Kamala has uh, spoken a little bit about it. There's a uh, sturgeon. The uh, wildlife that's in there, the sturgeon, the salmon, and uh, all the other creatures that survive in that river that are never really uh, shown uh, because like the sturgeon, we're right from the very mouth of the river, uh, probably all the way up to Hope and uh, where the, uh, where the soft bottom is, so, and the value of life that was created by the river, the the, the fishing life, the water, uh, and the things that all of that helps to sustain life just from that river, and uh, the uh, different communities that were there prior to prior to contact in the sense of before they were decimated by diseases and things that uh, created the uh, demise of our people and much of that uh, uh, the way they transported it was part of the highway uh, and that's all uh, human propelled vessels that went up and down the river. Those are the things that come to my mind. It's, uh, none of this is represented. There's this body of water that's contained by dikes all the way down from basically hope. And I know that they were talking about, let's preserve the shoreline of the river. And they came and they asked that question at Musqueam, these people that were concerned about the river. And I said, you're talking about preserving the dike system, right? And the ladies uh, kind of looked at me, what are you talking about, dikes? We're talking about the, the foreshore. I said, do you know where the foreshore is? The foreshore is probably 100 meters above waterline. Uh, we don't know that. And what we've seen this year in the uh, atmospheric river, where it overran the dikes in Sumas and and in Simon's uh, journal, he comes down the river and he doesn't know where he's at because he can't name anything. And he comes down and he all of a sudden says, the river opens up about a mile wide. And lo and behold, this, the atmospheric river exposed that. It's uh, about a mile cross at Sumas, is that where they drain the lake? So, so none of this is, is shown in, in any places uh, that could uh, uh, carry that history and show it to people that are around that area. People are suing the government because they didn't warn them about Sumas Lake and things like that, you know and how the different communities like Muskin was trying to uh, work with the city of Westminster and Delta to, uh, and the province. We had a real, pro real, real challenge with the province trying to recognize uh, the different uh, archeological sites uh, that would show in some way how life might have been, but we know that life did exist there, communities, and that's uh, 
that's not there. And uh, how the mouth of the river where the uh, uh, lower part is, where the airport is, where Lula Island is, uh, that's Richmond, and uh, Sea Island, how the Spaniard explorers that first came through completely missed the mouth of the river uh, and how Richmond area, Delta area is, is only existing because of the dike system. It uh, should have been over, uh, should have been covered by water in most places by now with the little rise in the river's height, in the water height uh, uh, around the world. So I, I can only uh, say it in that way there's, these things are not shown anywhere along the river or in any a, a community uh, buildings or, or walkways uh, that, that are there. That, uh, I don't know what's on the dike walkway along the Fraser River, but uh, it didn't sound like there was too much information about pre-existing life prior to colonization. Uh, well, I'll leave it at there. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Larry. That, that was a really good perspective, I think, for us to be thinking about the fact that what we see on a daily basis isn't the true river. Um, Kamala, did you have any thoughts on, on this question? I uh, sure do. Um, I guess to me, what this ultimately comes down to is what's reflected reinforces um, who's in charge. It reinforces this idea that the dominant culture is the author and the caretaker and the builder and the placemaker and the, you know, the panel maker and the juror and all that stuff. So um, what, by transforming that story, we are also trans, it's about decolonizing. It's not just like, oh, let's add more stories. It's actually about, no, we need to challenge and dismantle this, this colonial landscape and this colonial way of, of doing things because um, it's, a, it's infringing on the rights and title holders and their right to um, you know, have their decision-making authority and self-determination over their lands and waters and how their story is told and how they can maintain their relationships with their places and, and be seen as the first people of that area and be seen as the hosts and the ones who can talk about the importance of those places. So it's not just a matter of, okay, how will the city or how will the FRDC or how will the market add some pieces that might, you know, change the narrative a little bit. It's more about um, transforming those assumptions in the first place, which then hopefully can support um, self-determination and voice by the, the people who, whose lands that it is. So um, to me, once you start doing that, then then what they want to share and you know the names that they want to see and the um the artwork and the even the use of the land all of those things you know will flow from that so it's going to take time um but to me if we keep fixating which is what i see in heritage in general um and a lot of you know urban planning in general is just like adding if we keep looking at adding then we're not going to actually fundamentally you know change and challenge and dismantle um these problematic landscapes and, and narratives and ways of living so um i i i'm a big big believer and fan in in deaccessioning and removing um some of those those dudes who have had enough airtime and um you know looking at new ways of telling stories about the land that fundamentally um you know return decision making authority and storytelling about the land to the to the rights and title holders there you go. Thank you. Ah, that's fabulous. No, well, thank you. Um, I really appreciated hearing that. Uh, Kirsten, I know that you had some thoughts that were related to some of your own heritage in the Queensboro area. Um, I think you mentioned yeah. that earlier. I mean, my grandfather was a fisher um, and, and he was based in Vancouver and then also in Steveston. So um, I think by learning about Queensboro and the fishers there, the Japanese Canadian fishers there, it gave me a bigger perspective of um, Japanese Canadians um, 
and their relationship to the river um, on indigenous territory, of course. But, and I think what comes up for me because um, everything that Elder um, Larry Grant and Camilla Todd has said, I'm it's so eloquent, so powerful. So I'll only add a few tidbits here about Japanese Canadians, but I think what came up for me when I was again being reintroduced to the monumentalized area along the river was I kept on turning to the river and the power of the river. Um, and part of that power of the river is based on the stories that have been told to me by my um, mother's family about working on the river and the power of the river and how you need to respect the river and other waterways um, and not take them for granted. You can't control them. Um, and how, how those rivers sustain, have sustained the lives of say Japanese Canadians, other fishers and local economies. And so um, with those stories, I think the river, I mean, I don't know, I, th I think there's, there's got to be a way, the question is what's your perspective, perspective on um, how monuments could speak to the river significance. And I think all of these other um, social political changes need to occur. You can't just, as Camille is saying, um, add stories and add people to the narrative that's already there. And um, for example, in terms of Japanese Canadians, it's not just a matter of adding, I found this out, I didn't realize this before, that in Queens Park, uh, the, I think it's pronounced Anorex, um, was made available to the BC Securities Commission for um, rounding up Japanese Canadians um, before they were sent to incarceration camps. I didn't know that before. And it's not enough just to add a plaque um, to Queens Park. It's not enough just to add plaques um, to Queensboro um, and, and to note the, um, the removal of Japanese Canadians, but it's something more powerful about the river and um, how I think it sustains life, but turning to, as Camilla said, the, um, the, those who have the rights um, and who's, who are the title holders, um, and the need for them, for these nations to determine um, our relationship to the river, our respect for the river, and um, to enter into dialogue to change the colonial system. So that's what I have to add. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, speaking of the colonial system, Maddie, I know that you've probably seen a lot of that sort of stuff in the work that you've done. Do you have any thoughts on, from what you've been exposed to, uh, on how monuments could speak to the river's significance from this point forward? Yeah, thanks, Rob. I, I really struggled with this question, I think, for some of the same reasons as the other panelists. And I went down a road to thinking beyond monuments and started thinking of the river itself as a monument, um, a monument that needs to be preserved and protected and celebrated like we do with other things that we commemorate. I started wondering about a potential um, dual process of monumentalism that might be happening um, by monumentalizing the river. Do we then turn the river into a monument to those things? Um, and I also want to return to something Elder Larry said at the very beginning, which is questioning the use and need of physical monuments. As he said, monuments are something introduced by settlers to the area. They're not so post Salish monuments. Um, so if monuments are based on the assumption that we need physical reminders of a memory or a history, um, one, I wonder about the colonial roots of that approach, um, thinking about the role of oral histories and storytelling in indigenous cultures as a means of preserving and passing down memories. Um, but at the same time, I'm well aware that physical representations are extremely powerful symbols at this moment in time. Um, and if communities want to see themselves and see particular stories and histories represented, then of course I, I want to see that as well. Um, 
these are mostly more questions than than answers, I'm afraid, but those are some th things this question brought up for me. Thank you. Thank you, Maddie. I, I, I think I'm going to pass it over to Stephen now. Thank you for your four responses to my questions, everyone. Thanks, Rob, and, and thank you as well to um to all the panelists. And um, uh, we're going to open up the chat now to um to questions from anyone uh, in the audience or, or comments. Um, and maybe as we wait for for people to put some comments in there, um, I'd just like to make a, a couple of comments on on what I heard, which was, um, you know, first of all, the perspectives that we've heard, many of the perspectives we've heard tonight, are ones that we don't get to hear or don't get to hear very much. And they're probably quite eye-opening for a lot of people, including myself. And I think that's really important um, because they are, they are different perspectives, but they're just as important, if not more important perspectives um, than the ones we traditionally hear. And, and the second thing I would add is that in our work with the Musqueam, and uh, Nolan Charles is a counselor with Musqueam, he's been on our board of directors, and Karen and I get the privilege of working with Nolan on a very regular basis. When we talked about what we could do together, um, one of the things that the, the, that Nolan and some of the staff at Musqueam had said when we talked about these stories that Larry's Elder Larry's mentioned and that Kamala have mentioned, there's nowhere to tell them, but there's also nowhere to tell them from Indigenous perspectives. It's always from our I'm I'm a white settler. It's always our perspective, and and could we find could we use the center to try to tell them from those perspectives because it doesn't exist anywhere else. And how important that would be to be able to introduce people to uh, indigenous perspectives on on the river um, that that uh, that the First Nations have never had a chance to tell, and uh, and that that's I think one of the reasons that Watatlam is so important to us, and why tonight is so is so much about um, what we want to do with uh, with Watatlam. Um, with that, I'll look in the chat here. Um, let's see if we have any questions. Any. Any, oh, there's another one. Some thank you to the panelists. Comments mostly. Yeah, I mean, I'll I'll, th I'll throw one throw one out here, um, and we've heard some comments on this, but um, it, you know, given what we've heard, um, you know, it, it is what is the space or is there a space for the traditional historical settler narrative about the river? Um, you know, we've heard from from uh, from some comments i think kamala about you know and and maddie also said about not just tacking it on not, you have to talk about it differently eliminate but is is there any do you feel that there are, are there are any places for that traditional settler narrative and i'll open that up to anybody on the panel who would who would maybe like to comment on that uh, some, there's a couple more things um larry I, I would defer to you. It's it's up to your nations, really, if that's something you think should be there. <laughs> I I understand that. Thank you, Kamala. This uh, for me that uh, I know we began uh, a few years back at the Discovery Center trying to bring Indigenous perspective to the life on the river and uh, some of the stories we had there. And even in there, uh, at the time, there was a little uh, a model of a hop uh, picking camp uh, cabin. That's a tiny, tiny little cabin that they used to, uh, and they still do the same with itinerant workers if they can get away with it. The tiniest little shelter and um, I, when I first saw it, I said, no, this is not real. No, this model is not real. Uh, I have a memory of Hop Camp and Sardis and none of that was painted. And if it was painted, it was whitewashed. It was not, not painted at all. And uh, uh, it had straw for mattress, and that little cabin wasn't much bigger than that, uh, uh, like a size of a king size bed. That's a, almost the whole size of the cabin. So it uh, things like that. But also, I think you know, like the up at City Hall, 
up on, is it Queens Avenue or Kings Avenue <laughs> up there? Uh, there's no mention of indigenous people. Uh, Queens Park Arena, uh, those things can be uh, changed uh, in some way or other uh, that, that could exemplify and, uh, and help people to understand that there were people here before the queen showed up. Mm -hmm. uh, and I always thought that the Discovery Center was a, a really central place for, for something like that because the market is right there, the, the key is right there. And, uh, and I saw this, uh, this uh, uh, message from the chat and the condo builders on uh, on the waterfront, they, they're really, uh, and the city of uh, New Westminster or Delta or whoever, uh, which part of the uh, river is Sapperton, uh, they are living in the era of someone owning the waterfront and thereby being the owner of the waterfront, you can't trespass on it by other people. And uh, that's it. the city of, ben, uh, of New Westminster planning department needs to be made aware of those things that you can't do that. Uh, there's no more access to the river. And that cuts off all of the history of the indigenous people. Uh, uh, that, and, uh, for me, that's a, a little bit of uh, of where that is and how that is and how it's represented to, there. At this moment, we have the keg or used to be the keg restaurant mm. right down there. And that was the tram depot and the train station uh, when I was a boy. And, uh, for me, that, uh, uh, that's another area that can be used for mm -hmm. uh, uh, storytelling and, and how, how a lot of this was changed over and indigenous people lost their presence all throughout New Westminster. Anyways, and, that, uh, and that's something too that uh, we, uh, I don't know if, uh, any of the community would be amenable to changing the names of the bridges, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's that's the other part that I think that uh, should be looked into, or or even uh, something that needs to be discussed and brought forward, so that we can. Uh, is that are tie in the communities that existed prior to colonialism. So mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's the only way I can see it. So. What also comes up for me is when Larry shared how um, you said those signage. So those signs are, the, are those the ones across the river, the historical signs from Musqueam that you said were defaced? Oh yeah, that that's right there at, at uh, the Glen Rose uh, at the south uh, uh, footings of uh, yeah, uh, uh, and uh, there's an area that's designated Musqueam because uh, uh, we had uh, geology, yeah, you know, and uh, working there on an archaeological site also that that whole site is an archaeological site mm -hmm. that the province. Uh, and the archaeology department of British Columbia made the choice to save the pub that was across the street from the south footings of the Alec Fraser Bridge and it subsequently burned down. So it, uh, and uh, then they dug up the archaeological site without proper examination of it so mm -hmm. they allocated that little spot to the Muslim people to well, yeah. yeah 
sorry, yeah. So when you when you talk about that, because I a, a student of mine showed those signs, and I was so encouraged by that that th those signs were there. I didn't know that they had been defaced, and and also to address that question about you know where do settler colonial monuments mm -hmm. fit in all of this? I think um, well, there's a couple things. If the if those people, their actions and who they were, or those histories um, represent harm and represent pain and trauma. Then, then I think people need to just accept that. Um, you know, why why are you forcing uh, people who are impacted by these things to, to have to face them every day? Um, and then at the same time, um, there's such an imbalance right now, like you know, pretty much mm -hmm. relative absence or relative invisibility versus yeah. tons of colonial. So yeah. until we can see more balance, mm -hmm. there needs to be focus, funding, and support yeah. for Indigenous stories and visibility before we start talking about, well, can those ones stay, or should we fund more you know, colonial narratives? I mean, there's other communities too, of course. Um, but there's a real need for redress. And you know, somehow cities manage to come up with funding for all kinds of other things to be put on the land, and yet they still can't seem to come up with money to to even have the basics of the the, the Hunkaminum word for the river, you know, mm. like there's so many things that could be there, and there's such erasure that you know, yeah, those colonial dudes can can get out of the way, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, and that's a it's a really it's a and you've just answered a question that we had in the chat about you know living these kind of monuments, the, the old monuments and then and the newer stories living side by side and i think that's a uh, you know that's a, that's a direct response to that um about whether they can and and that not to paraphrase you but they they can't until there's some kind of funding and equality of of messages to uh, to allow because they just don't exist um i think that's a good point too kamala there's um you know with the barge where the barges in vancouver and english bay there was that sign that the city managed to put up really quickly it's barge tilling park um and somebody came and put and wrote in um, Indigenous language name for the place. And that, and and that was defaced. Yeah, and, and yeah, even that was defaced right. very quickly, right? Was, like, yeah. yeah, yeah. So but I think that's, that's why what's important about these monuments that isn't addressed is that there's these sites of rituals and ceremonies that are so scripted that it's impossible to actually have a critical dialogue and a meaningful dialogue. So, um, I think what also is really important are these dialogues <clears throat> and they should be sites of dialogue of criticism and then, <clears throat> you know, removal. If, if, if people can recognize how um, terrorizing they are to have a statue of someone who killed, I think Begbie killed, um, was it six major chiefs? Um, so, so people who commit atrocities, um, should, we, should we celebrate them? Um, they should be, and they need to be part of a dialogue. Um, and then the question is what needs to happen to them? But the other question is what is a monument um, or, or how, do we, how, do we, how do we construct and maintain symbolic places mm. that are meaningful to us that that speak to our responsibility and our relationship to the, the nations, to, um, the, to the land, to the waters. Again, in a time frame that speaks to the time frame that mm -hmm. Camilla and Elder um, Laird Grant have spoken to us, which is thousands of years, not just hundred years or, you know, my lifetime, right? So. Thank you, Kristen. And, and uh, there's another question, and maybe Rob or Rebecca or Maddie um, can comment on this, and that's um, the, the future. We've referenced a bit about the work that the city's done to look at monuments. Um, what, what are, where, what's the status of that, and, and what's, what, what can we expect, we as citizens of, uh, of the city in, in the future, in terms of the future of monuments? Could, I'm not sure who's the best one to comment on that, Rob or Maddie. I think it's still kind of up in the air. The process of us trying to figure out how to get to that place of developing a new system of, around monuments is, is happening right now. It's trying to inform and educate the community through dialogue and to educate ourselves. Um, I can't actually say what the policy is going to read yet because it's going to be informed by these processes. Uh, I, I can say that the traditional approach of having this 
list of names that could potentially be used that is then looked to to identify what could be on a, a piece of new land or not new land, but uh, streets or roads or otherwise, isn't the best approach to this kind of work because generally that list is isolated to a specific point in time and it's referenced through uh, a specific value set that isn't mm -hmm. necessarily attached to the community that is here at this time or attached to the indigenous communities that have been here for much longer. I think we would probably need to be addressing them on a piece by piece basis to this point, but then also looking at all of those named assets that are here right now and trying to prioritize how we can tackle each one of those one at a time. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm cognizant of the time and we're, I think we're over, but I will, there was one question about the future and future dialogues or future initiatives like this. And, and uh, maybe I'll, I'll just start and Karen, if you want, if you want to jump in, um, we, we want to do more of these at Discovery Center. We'd like to also do them in partnership with the city. Um, what they, what they are and what the topics are um it's so important for us that we we work on that and it be led by our musqueam partners so what what are they interested in talking about what kind of stories do, do they want to have dialogues on because if if we just do it from our perspective then we're just repeating what everyone else has already done but if we're doing it from a musqueam perspective or from other fraser river first nations perspective and from the japanese community's perspective then it then it's different then um it's telling those stories in their words from their perspective perspectives and uh and but but i would confident to say that i'm hoping this year we'll we'll have two or three others that we can do uh, that will involve our partners and uh, be able to share more stories that a lot of people haven't heard heard before and uh, they're really important to hear um so with that i'm sorry that uh, we didn't have time for more questions but um but again uh, just you know, not to repeat myself, but a, a number of things that we heard tonight from our panelists, um, I don't think a lot of people get to hear. I know I, I've been working now um, with the Discovery Center for 10 years, and, and there are many things tonight that I'd never heard of before. And I think it's important that those perspectives be shared. And so thank you so much um, to the panelists for coming on and sharing their perspectives. Thank you for, uh, for the way we communicated and we talked with each other, both electronically through the chat and also to uh, the panelists when they were speaking. I think it, it met the terms of what we try to do with our dialogues. So thank you for that. Um, you know, thanks to my colleagues um, at the at Karen at the Discovery Center and Robin Rebecca. Uh, we worked on this together in terms of identifying panelists, um, potential panelists and reaching out to them and then and then asking the questions tonight. And I, I think it worked really well. And mostly thank you for you. I mean, we had over 50 people um, on the, on this for most of the evening. And uh, and I think that that says good things about what people are interested in. And it's a start. We have a long way to go, but it's a start. And so uh, thank you to all of you for uh, for joining us this evening. And we hope to see you again uh, in, in the future. So um, with that, Rob, did you want to, any, any comments from the, from the city's point of view to close? Yeah, from the city's perspective, actually the New Westminster Museum and Archives uh, and Heritage Services, which I, I manage, I just really want to appreciate or express my appreciation to the panelists and to the Discovery Center from allowing us to come in on this process that you've been working towards. Uh, these conversations are touchy, these conversations are hypersensitive and they have the potential of going in a bad way if they happen in a public setting. And I think we had a really solid, uh, positive conversation around things today because it was looking towards the improvement of equity and solutions. Um, I also wanna note that uh, the, the New Westminster Museum and Archives has recently put on display the Judge Bagby statue. This is something that was removed from the plaza outside of the courthouse. We're not placing it upright. We've laid it down in the space and we're putting it out in conjunction with some other elements of our city's reconciliation work recently. Um, in passing the resolution, council said that the city worked with the museum and archives, the community and the Tsukotin nation to find an appropriate place for the statue. Uh, a start in that direction is beginning a conversation in our galleries around what it should or could be. There are no presumed assumptions that are being brought in place of that. So it's one of those monuments that has come down, um, but um, it's an unknown as to what it could be because even with the, within the Tsukotin nation, there are mixed feelings around how it should be working. Mm -hmm. 
So I invite you to all come down. Uh, interpretation is not fully up on the walls, but within the next couple of weeks, it will be. Uh, we have one piece by a fellow, an artist named uh, Luke Parnell called Neon Reconciliation Explosion, and we'll be doing an artist talk with him on the 17th of February. Still trying to figure out if it's virtual or in person. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you very much. Any if panelists, anybody want to say a word, a final word before we sign off? Maybe Larry can. can yeah, Larry? I, uh, I just wanted to comment that uh, they mentioned the barge in the park mm -hmm. and how the sign went up so quickly and then it came down just as quickly. And it's interesting because this is a this is a colonial thing that happened. The barge is a way up on the beach in the sense it's uh, probably uh, uh, a way above the amount that it draws uh, in water is probably the sand underneath it. When it went up there, my first thought was, wow, that's Wreck Beach North. <laughs> uh, many people do not understand that Rick Beach was uh, the site of uh, uh, lumber barges that were up on shore exactly like it is right now in Stanley Park along with several other uh, abandoned boats that were destroyed on the beach in the same manner that the storm had pushed them up on shore and and it was interesting to see that. Uh, mm. And this is interesting too, where they uh, pulled the sign down because it was being defaced by uh, indigenous language. Uh, the uh, Parks Board has just passed a motion to work with the indigenous communities, the Musqueam, Palmas, Tawata. And it's interesting that they uh, could pull a sign down because it had a, 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 an old Indian word on there. Mm -hmm. And I was squamish though. Yeah. Uh, but I want to say thank you also for having us on, uh, on the panel to discuss a little bit about how we feel about monuments and the, how the river it itself is sort of being pushed aside the actual value of the river mm -hmm. and uh, how we were uh, are thinking of equity amongst the two, uh, uh, well, more than two, the, uh, the settler population and, and the indigenous population to bring that uh, equity out where it's actually visible and being able to share equally in the in the successes of of settler uh, uh, society and indigenous society. I want to say thank you for including me this evening, and I want to say thank you to the other panelists. It's uh, great to see you. Mm -hmm. uh, being here this evening and sharing our stories. So I kept the same. See you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> yeah. Thank. Thank you so much. All right. Take care, everyone. Stay Bye. safe, and hopefully yeah. we uh, can see you all. See you all in person soon. Okay. One day. Good night. One day. All right. Good night. Good, <laughs> Good night. night Larry. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye.